Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we are excited to host today's webinar. Um, we'll give it just about one more minute for anybody to join in. We just want to make sure um, we have everyone with us, but we're excited to, to welcome you all today to Kelly's webinar. So we'll give it just one more minute to let people in. And just as a reminder, so this does, because we are a CAE approved provider, today's webinar does qualify for one hour of CAE credit. So if you would like to receive a certificate, email us over at iom at uschamber.com in order to receive that certificate upon completion of the webinar, just as a reminder. Um, and we will go ahead and get started today. So thank you again for joining us. As some of you may know, you may know Kelly. Um, some of you may not. Kelly has been in the industry since 1986 and in her current position as president and CEO at the Longview Chamber of Commerce in Longview, Texas since 2005. Her areas of expertise are in contract negotiations and in, in business and community development initiatives. Um, as you may know, education and professional development are at the core of who Kelly is. She earned her master's degree in strategic lead leadership in 2014 and completed Leadership Texas with the Texas Women's Foundation in 2007. She will be the first to say that she's had many successes in her career and failure, but she believes in failing forward. Um, we'd like to turn the time over to Kelly to, um, to present her webinar today. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to be back and fun to be, that we're having a webinar, for an institute class here live, kind of, sort of. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about what it takes to run an excellent organization. And for those of you who know me, you know, I'm just going to tell the truth because I've made so many mistakes. My ego has gotten in the way. My fear has gotten in the way. My naivety has gotten in the way. But when we start to realize it's OK, it's OK. And so that's we're just going to have a conversation about best practices, where to go for information, who to lean on for help. So the way I've designed today is we're going to walk through the four disciplines. Um, and I'm a huge, huge Patrick Lencioni fan. I'm also a believer in the EOS system. So we're going to you're going to see a lot of materials emerging through the discussion. So at the end of each discipline, the way we've set it up is if you want to ask a question related to that discipline, please put it in the chat. And then at the end of the discipline, we'll take a couple of minutes, see if there's questions, answer those before we move on to the next discipline. I think we're going to have a good time talking about the four disciplines of a healthy organization today. So what's number one? Build and maintain a cohesive leadership team. Guys, this is probably where I have screwed up the most. Um, when I started in 1986, I was a one person shop. And my, so the team was the board. The team was the committee. Now, I know I'm old, but I wasn't old in 1986. So I didn't have the life experiences. I had training, but I did not have the life experiences to trust myself to ask for help. So I'm going to give you an example. I thought it was all on me. I thought I was responsible for getting every volunteer lined up. I thought I was responsible for writing every document. I thought I was responsible for preparing all the board materials by myself. I thought I had to think of it and act on it and master it alone. And that's wrong. I also was raised with Kelly, fake it till you make it. You've got a great smile. You're smart. 
You can do whatever you set your mind to. So fake it until you make it. I wish I had never been taught that. I wish I had been taught, Kelly, build a support team around you. It's all about relationships. Tell them where your strengths are. Tell them where your weaknesses are and put complementary personality styles around you to build and maintain that cohesive leadership. It's only been in the last couple of years that our organization integrated EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating Systems. And I'll be honest, I heard about this at an ACCE conference, as did a couple of my staff members. So we came back and we investigated it. And one of my team members, Dave Jokum, he really said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to really look into this. So he started interviewing other chambers and he said, we need to take this on because we need to do a better job of developing our people. We we've got our vision down, but we really don't have our scorecard and our measurables and our KPIs or whatever you call it in place internally. We have it externally, but not internally. We had really sharpened our skills over the last 10 years of developing those operating systems internally, but maybe they weren't as robust as they needed to be. So who, when Kelly chooses to leave or one of our team members choose to leave the organization, you know, what a cohesive leadership team does is make sure those systems are in place that somebody can pick up the ball and follow you and be more successful than you than when you left because that's what leaders do we also had struggled with talking about issues and that could be personality issues that may be hey because you didn't get the financial notes written in time i couldn't send out the board packet on time so now we're going to have to change our agenda because we didn't meet the board expectations and that creates yuck in the office so down to those little things how do you how do we how do i discuss issues in the workplace so as we walk through discipline number one you're going to see that i'm going to talk about patrick lencioni's materials with the five behaviors of current team bottom line is guys we we can have results, but if we don't trust one another on the team, if we don't deal with the conflict that is going to happen on our team, if we're not all in with our team and holding ourselves accountable and holding the tough part is holding each other accountable, then we're, we may have results, but we're not going to have intentional, strategic and impactful results. So how do we get there how do we build that trust i believe in using the materials from five dysfunctions of a team so i'm just going to show you some of the screw-ups in my life again it's where i learned the most when i came here i had a, a good sized team we managed numerous city contracts at that time um but it wasn't a team i had built and because I came in thinking, well, they've hired me because I'm so good, little Miss Arrogant didn't realize how I came across. And it wasn't healthy. So I, I didn't realize I was building barriers with the team. We did team building. We did all the touchy feely things, but I didn't put the tools in place. I didn't build the relationships deep enough to build trust to where we could have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. So it created conflict in the workplace. And when I tried to hold team members accountable, again, I'm thinking it's all about me still, and it's not, it's not about me at all. Accountability was tough. So I hired a consultant. I said, I've got to change, something's not clicking here. You know, we have all the we're we're hit, we're mate, we're we're doing good work. We we become accredited. We're doing this. We're doing that. But it's not gelling. It doesn't feel right. And thank goodness I was able to recognize that. And that's with this organization. So I've been in it a while. So the consultant starts walking us through the five dysfunctions of a team. 
I'm thinking this, I took them to my home. I cooked for them. I'm thinking, okay, a servant's heart. How's this going to look to have a great organization? I know we need a great team. Well, that was not a fun process, not a fun process at all. And my consultant's like, it'll be okay. It's got to get yucky first before it gets better. So we started making baby steps. Well, unfortunately, some things didn't get better. And we had our annual meeting banquet. And a couple of my employees chose to get drunk, which was not a good day. So the next day, my team did an intervention on me. They took me to Cracker Barrel. This is the really strong team members. And they said, Kelly, if we don't get our heads around this, we see what you're trying to do. We value what you're trying to do. But if we don't eliminate the cancer that's in our building, our team is never going to get healthy. Well, while I may come across as strong and independent and courageous and some things, I still hate conflict and I still hate letting people go. And so I realized that day, if I was going to truly build a foundation of trust with the employees I wanted to keep, and I wanted to learn how to work through conflict, commitment, accountability to get the results, I was going to have to let people go. And we did. And that was a horrible few months of process of going through the five dysfunctions of a team. But the great news is, we, are will, we were willing to do what it took. I was willing to do what it would take to build a really great team. Fast forward, because of the pain, we've implemented, like I said, the EOS strategies. We use the Patrick Lencioni materials. We hold ourselves accountable. And we'll go deeper into how that looks in a few minutes. But I think the biggest point here is what are you willing to let go of? I had to face my fears and use my fears to ask for help. I had to recognize I was still extremely naive in thinking everything's going to be okay. All we have to do is work through these worksheets. All we have to do is do these team building sessions. All we have to do is get our five-star accreditation. All we have to do is send staff members to Institute or Academy at WACE or go to the Texas Basics course or whatever those tools were out there. As long as I did the right things, it was going to be okay. But it wasn't. So I had to really look at myself and say, Kelly, what are you willing to let go of? How are you going to allow others to shine on your team? And how are you going to build this cohesiveness? So discipline number one has to do with facing the reality of where we are to build a great team. So let's talk a little bit about the tools that are out there. You hit a fun one. If you have a lot of touchy-feely people, guys, I'm not a touchy-feely person. I try. But True Colors Personality Assessment is a good tool if you're shepherding a young team and you're trying to get to know each other. It's fun. It's interactive. It's a good tool. I'm a huge advocate for DISC. Um, and that's the four different personality types. And just so you know, I'm 51% D and I'm a 49% C. So I have a split personality. Then you go into the Myers-Briggs type indicator. And that's the, it, for me, I'm an introvert. I'm, so I'm an I end, the N's intuitive, T's the thinker and J's the judger. So in the Myers-Briggs type indicator, I'm an INTJ and I know what my team members are. The Enneagram, um, that's a little bit deeper dive. I highly recommend it, but it does take a little bit more training and work to work through. I've not done that with my team. I've done that on my personal level with some family members uh, in my support group systems. We've done the Enneagram together. Uh, I'm a number three on the Enneagram. You go through the Clifton Strengths Finder. I put that on the top because it's my very favorite. You can find that on the Gallup website. And I really enjoy the Clifton Strengths Finder because it shows us the top the areas, nine areas we're strongest in. And then when you have your team do it with you, you can do all kinds of cool charts to show 
okay, on our team, we have especially an executive team. If there's more than one of you and you have three or five or 20, it doesn't matter. You can look at your different subgroups and your executive team to see where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, when you're hiring, what types of things to hire from so that you're complementing your team. So when I started, I told you I was raised to project the attitude, fake it till you make it. And like I said, I wish I had never been taught that because I believe that tells people that we should master everything. We should be the master of our workplace. We should be the master in our lives. How do you build teams, though, if you're a master? You don't. It's when we build relationships and gain understanding of each other that we can motivate each other. We can coach each other. It's not up to me as the CEO to do that by myself. It's up to me to build an environment where we can learn how to do that together. For those of you who know my team members, you know Dave Jokum, he's he's my number two. He's the one that does staff evaluations. He's the one that coordinates a lot of the things that allows me to do what I'm best at with my personality profile. And learning how to let go allowed us to move forward. So that's discipline number one. Yeah. Do you were yeah, just, any questions? Yeah, just on that note, I wanted to open up. Does anybody have any questions on the first discipline um, as you reflect in your organizations of how you've seen um, building and maintaining of a cohesive leadership team? Does anyone have any questions um, for Kelly? Excellent. We have some great comments. Um, loving this. Um, high praises. So thank you, Kelly. Looks like no questions at this time. Thanks. All righty. So discipline number two, creating organizational clarity. All right. This is another one that I've struggled with because I am a uh, strategic thinker, a planner, I'm a documenter, I'm a processor, I'm very task oriented, I'm visionary, so I drive people crazy. People don't know when I say something, hey, I may just be saying something. It doesn't mean I'm asking you to do it. I'm just talking out loud and brainstorming ideas. And my, I was driving my staff crazy. So when Dave says EOS, I really didn't want to do it. He will tell you that. It's the best thing we ever did because it helped us focus in on those things that are really important. And that's clarity. So even though we had our core values as an organization, we didn't have internal core values. So what does that really mean? It means we weren't hiring to our values. We were hiring on different things which were good best practices but the person wasn't a good fit. And I'm thinking, why is this happening? You know, they'll last four or five years. The average tenure here is about seven years. So why couldn't we build that longevity? I remained friends with a lot of these people when they left, but they didn't work here anymore. Was And I was thinking, well, we don't pay enough. I was finding all kinds of excuses. But the bottom line is, we hadn't agreed upon a core set of values with internally about how we believe, what are our expectations and defining those things then allowed us to go into what's our core focus. Leading people, leading prosperity. Well, if leading people, leading prosperity is our core focus, then what's our niche? Because it isn't about events, folks. Events is not a core focus. Events is not a niche. Anybody can do it. But what our niche was, we know how to rally key influencers. We know how to align key influencers. We have been developing key influencers and reteaching ourselves how to dream as a community to move our community forward, which is leading people, leading prosperity. So we internally identified what our niche was. We didn't ask our board what our niche is because that's not their job. 
our job is to understand these things with inside the organization, which is going to lead to more clarity. The other thing that was huge was sitting down and saying, where do we want to be in 10 years as a, as a company? Where do we want to be in 10 years? And what's it going to take us to get there? And so we do a five-year strategic plan as an organization, but internally we have a one-year plan, a three-year plan, a 10-year focus, and then we set quarterly rocks. We have, and we'll go into a little bit of this, but it helped us clarify who we are, but more importantly, why do we exist? So then we could start working into our marketing strategies even further. So you heard me talk about, you know, what we do, how we do it a little bit, when, when the when, the who, the what, the where, the why, the common question is. But the reality is it's about our why. And so internally, we knew what our now we know what our focus needs to be. We understand our niche. We have our values that we can hire from as an organization. Are we still learning about what is our why and how do we bring the board alongside us? How do we bring our volunteers alongside us to buy into what our why is? I'm going to challenge you if you have it, because I know a lot of you already have seen the Simon Sinek's why video. I'm going to ask you, move, go rewatch that video with your executive team, with your team, with your board, and go through and just have that conversation about what is our why? What is the core belief? And that's what led to our core belief is we believe in leading people. We believe in leading prosperity. And if you want to take it further, we believe in preparing a community for the next generation so that generation can lead and be prosperous. And we've put the systems in place. That's the legacy this organization wants to have. And that's why we do the things we do. How we do that is by internally implementing the tools from Patrick Lencioni, which is built, let me tell you that Jim Collins, Patrick Lencioni, all the greats, their material has been taken and, and put into the EOS systems and processes, which allows our team to emerge and be the best that they can be. So we move from our why to our how to our what, and the what does, what we do fulfills that belief. So I'm going to brag on a regional organization called the Western Association of Chambers of Commerce Executives. And several years ago, they, you know, every they'll do these studies. And what they realized was a lot of chambers over the years have fallen into the trap of becoming what's known as in three P's, the parade party pageant chamber. And when we went through COVID, oh my gosh. How many of our friends left the industry because it was so hard? Where did the money go? Chambers actually shut their doors. Where did the chambers go? I think it's because a lot of us get caught up in the trap of the 3P concept because it feels good. It's a quick fix to helping our customers see some kind of you know, return on investment. But the reality is we need to be a 3C chamber. We need to be the convener. We need to be the champion. We need to be the catalytic leader. And when, when we start moving in that direction, the value that we bring to the table becomes so much greater than some party or event or parade that we put on. Because we're having the tough decisions, we're, we're taking on the issues that matter, we are moving our community forward and, pro and protecting that business environment. That ch that's why chambers were started, was to advocate on behalf of business, not throw a party. So when I talk to er with organizations about clarity, I would ask you to say, ask your board. If they were going to sell a membership, are they selling a membership or are they go into an investor to invest in a company that's going to build a community for tomorrow? Words matter. Perception matters. 
The way we develop and train our team and our board matters. So we've got this little basic back to basic checklist. COVID, one thing that it did, I heard this a lot with chambers, we've got to get back to basics. So what, what does that look like? Number one, know your why. Are you passionate about your why? Are you going to be all in about your why? Are you going to do what it takes to clarify, embrace the little things? Are you going to hire on behavioral values that support the values of the organization? Are you clear and aligned around a strategy that helps define success? I'm going to give you a little example. We may think we know that. So um, I was at a chamber program pre-COVID, before COVID, BC. And it was on, you know, how civics have been taken out of the classroom. We were talking about a generation who doesn't even know what free enterprise, um, democracy, opportunity, it, you know, it was what is capital? Why is capitalism important? Why is free market important? What does socialism mean? Do you know, is there a movement in social? You know, what does a socialist country look like? Well, how does that impact our business community? How does that impact the business environment we're charged to protect? I thought that was pretty interesting. I'm thinking, well, I work for a chamber of commerce. My team, we're good. We got this. I took a look, brought back the quiz. Half my employees couldn't tell me what capitalism meant versus socialism. What are those def those definitions and what is the difference? Guys, that's clarity. And as an organization who fights to protect the rights of business, we need to make sure those value systems are in place with our board, our staff and our volunteers, because do you see how easily we could become derailed and focused on the things that maybe aren't important? So a clarity checklist includes clear current goals, understanding one another's roles, having job descriptions for your board members, your staff, your volunteers. Are you training them? This program could be hours long. But we need to make sure we have these systems in place. Organizational clarity is key. And we need to be able to concisely summarize those different areas internally and externally and making sure we're reviewing them on a regular basis. Because otherwise, we're going to be a team that's just rolling over each other. Um, yesterday, Dave and I were brainstorming. We had a fabulous 40 under 40 workshop and he's in the middle of closing out a leadership long view year. And we were excited about the alumni and just talking about the leadership piece of our organization. And then it just dawned on me. I said, you know, Dave, we've been doing leadership long view for how long? How do we incorporate our strategic plan for organizational clarity into leadership long view? Both of us were just like going, we don't. We we do, but we don't. So our new strategic plan is heart, health, education, advocacy, redevelopment, and talent. Those are the five pillars we're focused on. We can easily morph this acronym into the 22-23 Leadership Long View Program. It'll help us define clarity with what we're focusing on. So I would challenge you at your next staff meeting. Can you ask your team members just quickly tell you to articulate the why of your organization? Can you, can they do that? Can the employee connect their role as the receptionist, front desk person, program manager to the overall direction of the organization and know why they're important? to the organization and without them, we wouldn't have organization. Can your team members or even you differentiate yourself from who you think your competition is? Who is your competition in your community? It is their competition. My staff would say, 
Kelly, we need to be doing leads groups. We have BNI. I said, well, I think BNI is a great organization. Why do we need to have leads groups then? How, there's only six and a half of us, thousand members, $1.2 million budget. BN, that's going to take a lot of staff work. What's it going to do for us in the in 15 years? I kind of look at it as the five, five, five rule. Is it a, is what's important? Five minutes, 15 minutes or five years? Because I want us focused on the things that's going to drive this community forward and support those other organizations that do the things that help those businesses with what they the transactions they need today. Every organization is different. We just don't have that capacity. Can your staff discuss what your goals are? Do they, can the, does the staff know how those goals are going to shift from a monthly, quarterly, or annually basis? Are you training your ambassadors or your salespeople to think investment versus transaction? You heard me say, can a board member sell a membership or does a board member attract investors to come to the table? So two weeks ago, we had a had a board member email me. You need to go talk to this roofing company. They need a ribbon cutting. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a brown one. Well, that is not how we need to be training our board members. We need to be. Yes, ribbon cuttings have a place, but that doesn't need to be the why the member needs to come to the table. So it's if we have the things in place, the trainings, the tools, the materials in place to bring clarity, Kelly isn't going to get those emails or those text messages, jump, run for a ribbon cutting. So, hey, they did join. I didn't do it. Dave allocated that out and we got her done. But I'm just going to say organizational clarity is key. All right. Reinforcing clarity. So have you built a cohesive team? Do you have your job descriptions in place? Do they understand the value they bring to the table? How are you creating clarity for your staff, your volunteers, your board? Are you doing these trainings on a regular basis or is it a one and done with you? Because I will tell you for me, I, you know, I, I, I used to think I've already done this. I've already told them this. Our staff, I can hold them at a little bit of higher account accountability. But really, how wrapped up do I get in? doing things like getting ready for this workshop today. I helped another chamber this morning on foundation development with their board. This afternoon is my board meeting, my. So and all of a sudden, I'm not thinking about my team again. So if I get that wrapped up, I know my team's getting wrapped up. So we need to be making sure we're coming back and having the conversation to clarify roles, clarify our why, our how, our what, and where we're going. So reinforcing clarity is a very important tool. So before we, I'm going to back up. So before we go into discipline three, any questions? I just want to take a pause moment. Well, everyone, if anyone has a question, I would just say we have some great conversation going on in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for your engagement. It's really great to see the collaboration of what's being um, learned and incorporating that and just the networking. So great conversation in the chat, but it doesn't look like any questions there, but just wanted to give a shout out for everyone engaging there. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So you've heard me talk a lot about now clarity. Reinforcing that clarity. Now we're going to talk about over communicating that clarity. Now I will also tell you I hate used to. Let me back up. I used to hate staff meetings. I really did. I thought they were like, oh my God, if we have to look at this calendar one more time, if I have to listen one more time about this member or this volunteer, I'm just I'm just going to get up and leave. If I feel the eggshells in a meeting room because we're we don't want to hold each other accountable, we take time to do these trainings. I'm just going to pull my teeth out. Well, 
One of the things I really like about EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system is Dave, not Kelly, letting go. Dave makes sure that we have two different types of staff meetings a week. Don't freak out. I don't go to two meetings a week. I go to one meeting a week. So we have our what we call level 10 meetings. So our executive team, we meet every Monday at three from 3.30 to 5. And then the staff meets on Tuesdays from 9.30 to 11 with Dave. And every agenda starts out the same way. We are sharing good news. So it's called a segue. So we're, hey, what's your personal best this last week? And what's your business best this next week? And we keep it short. We don't just vomit on people. We keep it short. Because we forget to tell the good news stories, guys. And then we have a scorecard. So we we all we monitor certain things in the organization that we believe moves the entire organization forward. Now, it's not how many people showed up at an event. It's not how many emails did I send. It's not. It's the big picture items of if you as the CEO. Or you as the number two have to be gone for a month because you've had surgery. What are those most critical items you need to be aware of and stay in communication with your board chairman? That's the way we look at our scorecarding. And then we as committees and things, we have our own scorecards and we handle that a little bit different within the way we run our production schedules, et cetera. But as a team, we have agreed on a core set of principles that we're going to hold ourselves accountable to. So an example last year would have been membership. We average, I don't know, 100 to 110 new members a year without really trying. Pretty sad, but we do Um, because we know if we can get 110 to 120 new members a year, we'll always have a high retention rate. We're always we're going to maintain, create new dollars, et cetera. Last year, we didn't do that. So I had heard of the Holman brothers for years. I heard Doug Holman the first time when he worked at the San Diego Chamber. We had him in Texas a couple of times. Well, I was having lunch with Mike Neal and Doug Holman sits down and Mike says, Mike and I have been in the industry about the same amount of time. He says, best decision I've ever made, Kelly. I was sitting down with Doug and Dave and I had a couple of friends walk by, stopped and said, Kelly, best investment I ever made. Well, we hired the Holman brothers as a result of those conversations. Because why? Because we had scorecard history now. We had historical data. We knew in order to move this initiative forward, we had to change the way we do business. That's over communicating organizational clarity based on data and good information. So we move through the meeting. You can see we do a rock review. Those are big picture things that are that that we want to do. That's not in the normal course of our work. We talk about good news. What's going on with our members? What do we need to be aware of? Who's moving? Who's expanding? And making sure we're reporting that back. We're working through our to-do list. We're working through issues. We wrap up in 90 minutes and we score our meeting. That's or over communicating organizational clarity. And then we also identify what are those cascading messages that need to take place as a result of these messages? Because don't you hate it when one of your team members says, I didn't know that. Nobody told me. Really? So by developing cascading messages out of our meetings, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. So we we've developed healthier habits. To build and maintain the cohesive team, to create that organizational clarity, to moving us towards over communicating so that we can do a better job of holding ourselves accountable. So unless somebody tells me there's a question, I'm going to move in to number discipline number four. Yeah. So, Kelly, it looks like um, real quick, we do have um, two questions. The first is, um, do you have your core values posted? And then the second is if you can just expound on what a level 10 meeting is. 
OK. Um, we have. I did the slide where you, it was the VTO and you'll get this PowerPoint, um, but we do have our values. Listed, they're not hanging up at a wall. Um, because they're internal values. These are not our external values. Now, there are chambers out there that have sent me really cool pictures of how they've done their core values and they've done cool wall mounts. And we've talked about doing that, but we have so much shared space in our the way we operate. We haven't found that right place to post those. And maybe we need to just take the risk of doing it because it would generate additional conversations when people come in and they go, well, that's not the chamber values. Y'all focus on this. What's this? And then maybe it'll show that as a company, we're operating at a higher level than what maybe they even think. So I think that's a valid question. Uh, we've not done that yet. So, but it's something that we've definitely talked about. So a level 10 meeting. And when studying, studying Patrick Lencioni, he has and he has different words for his meetings. I'm trying to remember remember what they call it. But the level 10 means we're, we're sitting down, we're dedicating 90 minutes a week, we have a same agenda outline every week, we're posting items to the next week's agenda on the things to do, we're identifying issues. Now, I'm not talking about somebody's feelings got hurt. Maybe it is on there. But really, it's about the things that prevent us from operating at that highest level. What are What's keeping us from being our, our very best? Then those are, we start documenting those issues and how we're working through them. So when Patrick Lencioni talks about his different styles of meetings, he has a huddle meeting. That's where you walk in the door maybe and you've got a team you just need to spend a few minutes with and everybody's standing around and you huddle up. Or maybe you have a team meeting and it lasts 15 minutes. It's just to check in on specific projects. So 1110 is not about just doing walking through a calendar or a production schedule or your financials. It's a bigger, it's a deeper level, a deeper dive into clarity about systems. I hope that answered the question. Um, I don't see any comments, so if not, we can always circle back. Okay. Uh, so I'll let you continue. Thank you for expanding on that. So this this, this whole topic around um, reinforce organizational clarity systems really does have to do with going back to the beginning when we're hiring our staff, looking at the questions. How do you make sure once you've identified those internal values, what types of behavioral questions does your interview process look like to ensure you're hiring, not just on skills. Skills are great. You can teach people what you need them to know, but values is a different type of conversation. So a, a how, how does that look for us today? Two years ago, I guess it's been we hired a young lady out of college, so excited, well connected in the community, you know, marketing degree, uh, just a go getter. Just we were excited about her. everything we were. People were calling us saying, oh, my gosh, we're so excited you hired this young lady. She'd been with us 52 days. I want you to think about that. She had already been off 11 days. Not a good sign. Now, this is before we started hiring on values. Walks in and says, oh, Dave, I forgot to tell you about I need to be gone. And he had had enough because she was late. Long lunch hours, what need, always leaving early and out of the 52 days, she'd already been gone 11 and now once off more. We're not even through the 90 day probation period. And he said, well, I guess you have a decision to make, don't you? And she's like, what? You know, and he's like, if you leave, don't come back because you've already left enough. And that was a really good wake up call for us to evaluate the values of the workplace. So those are some tough conversations, but it's better to have them before you hire the wrong person. 
Another part about the EOS system that I like is a quarterly check-in. I'm a big believer in continuous feedback loops. I am not good at executing on continuous feedback loops. I mean, this this week alone, we had the candidate forum. We had the 40 under 40. We're wrapping up leadership long view. We've got an elected officials reception Tuesday. Oh, our golf tournament's tomorrow. And that's not even everything that we have going on. And like you, you're bal- you're just juggling balls left and right. But if we wait till the end of the year to give a review, shame on us. So we developed event closeout systems. So after every and you heard me, I'm talking, we don't do community events. Our events is our state of series, our 40 under 40 workshops, our leadership long view, whatever we're working on, our inner city trips. We close it out financially and we have the, the that's when we have the feedback conversation. We look at our production schedules. What do we need to improve? And it's not Kelly doing it. It's somebody else leading those conversations so that we can get the work done. So reinforcing reinforcing organization through human systems are our internal processes. It's also how do you celebrate? How do you celebrate success? We received Chamber of the Year from ACCE in 2019. Had a couple of board members go with this, celebrated while we were at ACCE. I'm thinking we're done. Remember, Kelly's not that touchy feely person. Well, I come back and one of my board members has ordered this huge cake, put the logo of the the uh, winning the award on it, bought fancy champagne, not cheap. We're talking sixty dollar bottle champagne. To me, that's fancy. And had it at the next board meeting because, by golly, he wanted us to stop and pause and let everyone know this was a team effort. And I was so appreciative because that's not something I'm good at. So how are you rewarding and recognizing your staff, your volunteers? That's an important part of reinforcing organizational clarity. Don't give everybody a trophy. Reward those that are moving your strategic plan forward. I love this quote by Patrick Lencioni. The single greatest advantage any company can achieve is organizational health. Yet it is ignored by most leaders, even though it is simple free and available to anybody who wants it. I'm guilty of this because I told you I was a task oriented person. I'm a visionary. I'm thinking about, okay, we have inner city trip in June. We just finished the DC trip. I'm working on next falls or next spring's uh, Austin trip. All this is running through my head. That's programs. It's not organizational health. Organizational health is putting the systems in place and building the people to walk alongside you to have the discipline to execute on the big ideas. That's organizational health, guys. I'm I'm thinking through what I want to how how authentic I want to be. I think I'll skip that story. Okay. So the four discipline model, you can call me and I'll tell you that story. We've talked about building and maintaining a cohesive leadership team. We've talked about creating organizational clarity. We've talked about the importance of over communicating organizational clarity. And then we've talked about reinforcing organizational clarity through human systems. So, again, I just want to pause and see if there's any questions. We don't have any questions in the chat, but again, just more engagement. It sounds like um, the several have their uh, core values posted and framed, and they really enjoyed the last quote. So just to share what's going on in the chat. Okay, good deal. So as we're taking that deeper dive and we're looking at clarity, strategic intention is a very important part of this conversation. Do you have your vision for the organization? Do you have a mission 
for your organization? Do you have values for your organization? Now, those we have posted in our boardroom. And then we update, you know, if you ever want to see it, I'll send you a picture. So we have our vision, our mission. And then in the middle, we even have those five pillars. So it used to be reach, redevelopment, education, advocacy, collaboration, and health. Now it's heart, health, education, advocacy, redevelopment, and talent. And those are posted in the middle of the boardroom wall to remind us every time we walk in, what are we focused on? The other thing that's important is making sure we have financial systems in place. So we still do just a single fiscal year uh, budget. My goal is to somehow get us to that two year, maybe three year budgeting process. Yes, we have lenses. We do these different types of analysis. But getting us to that finance piece where we're doing multi-year budgeting, I think that would be the ultimate goal. Marketing. Boy, has marketing shifted in our world today with digital marketing. I'm not talking social media. I'm talking about an intentional digital marketing plan where we're reaching different audiences. And why? How are we communicating? Is it through e-buzzes, social media? Are people, is there so much noise that are, are, we're losing track of what we're communicating or why we're communicating? How do we de develop talent? That's internally. Are you are you committed to making sure your team's members, every team member's getting a minimum of 30 or 40 development hours a year? How are you developing your board? How are you developing your volunteers? Technology. Boy, what has COVID shown us? We've got we have spent more on technology, <coughs> excuse me, in the last seven years. About the time I think, man, we've got it going on. We don't have it going on again. And so making sure you're, you're analyzing technology needs and you're budgeting for that technology and governance. What governance do documents do you have in place? What policies do you have in place that you can share from year to year, whether it's your board chair or your board collectively, so that when you're taking them through an orientation, they understand you have communication policies and no one speaks on behalf of the chamber, but you as the CEO or your board chairman. What happens if you have a disaster? Do you know where you're going to be housed if your building is? It's, you know, I mean, look at what happened in Joplin, Missouri and some of these Denton, uh, Texas. There's been I can just go through and list through, nat through these natural disasters, flooding, tornadoes hail damage, hurricanes, whatever it is, chambers are displaced. If you have your governance documents in place, you can, you're you ready. You don't like it, but you're ready and you know where to go, how to do it, and you have all these systems in place. And that's why I love accreditation. And I can't teach a course without plugging accreditation because there's nine areas you're going to walk through as you go through, whether you go through the formal process, which I encourage you to do, but at least do it just to do it because you can see where the gaps in the organization are and that's governance. So please make sure you have your house in order. A little blurry slide here. Um, identifying shifts and trends. Where are you getting your information? What are you reading? What are you paying attention to? I mean, things are constantly changing. There is a cool video that comes out on YouTube every year about shift, S-H-I-F-T, not the other word. Shift happens and it's updated every year. Every year I show that to my board because things are constantly changing and they need to be aware. This is a global market. And then how do we scale that back to our, each of our communities? Here's another great quote. The pivotal difference between a successful organization and a mediocre organization or an unsuccessful one has little. The pivotal difference between a successful organization and a mediocre organization or unsuccessful one has little, if anything, to do with what they know or how smart they are. It has everything to do with how healthy we are. I'm talking about, guys, the health of the organization. 
You can be as smart and run smart goals all day long. And I believe in smart goals. But if you aren't running healthy goals alongside that, then you're not a healthy organization. You're just doing a lot of stuff that may have impact or may not. So I hope that when you walk away from today, you want to embrace a healthy organization. You have a vision for what you need to be doing inside the organization. You have a vision of what needs to happen outside of the organization. And you build an, an organizational assessment that allows you to look at your framework, your objectives. How are you measuring? Where are you going? How do you celebrate those key results and tell the community, here it is, guys, and we're sticking with it. So again, there's basically four disciplines in building a healthy organization. Build and maintain a leadership team, organizational clarity, over communicate, over communicate and reinforce. So where do I go get my materials from? Here's some great example. John Maxwell reading materials are great. Patrick Lencioni materials are great. Um, Discovering the Leader in You by King, Altman, and Lee. Fabulous, fabulous read. Then we have our associations that we can lean on, like the U.S. Chamber, the, Oce the Association of Chamber Execs, the Association of Society of Association Execs, the Councils for Nonprofits, the Society for Nonprofits. We have great tools at our disposal, but we have to make a conscious choice. Will we let fear keep us from being healthy because of how we may look, because we faked it for so long? Are we going to remain naive and not be willing to examine and explore best practices and think we have to be the master of all when we don't? We build teams that support us and lift us up and move us forward. What kind of CEO are you going to be? Because it just takes a step moving in the right direction. So if you'd like more information about me, this is who I am. That's my direct line, my email address. I'm happy to have that sidebar conversation. I'm happy to share information. If you can't tell, I love what I do. I believe in the work of a Chamber of Commerce, and I hope you do too. Thanks for asking me to participate today. Thank you, Kelly. And just to wrap up, we did have some questions coming in here at the end. So we'll, when we cognizant of time, we'll do a little rapid fire. Um, first off, where do you get all that super energy? <laughs> <laughs> I get up early. I meditate for an hour every morning and journal and pray and read. Excellent. And that helps me focus through the day. Every day is a step. Excellent. And um, we had another question. What if you don't have board support for the four disciplines? How would you be able to sell your concept? It's not up to your board. This is an internal review and reflection for you and your team. And if you start doing it internally and you have these, you develop these habits, it becomes contagious. So my question is, why would you bring the board into this conversation unless you're a one person or two person shop? Then it's one or two of your executive board members that you're bringing in alongside you and developing you and take. Don't try to conquer the whole board. Their job is to set policy, prove policy, make sure governance systems are in place, not be in the weeds of the organization. Thank you. And how does organizational culture align with organizational clarity? Organizational culture to me is about the, the daily walk in the workplace. Is it continually consistent in the workplace? Do, do team members feel comfortable working through problems together without bringing the boss into the conversation? That's a culture. Clarity is how we communicate what we're doing, how we reinforce that through systems and processes. So that's where the smart and the health are intertwined for me. And as staff members change, how do you introduce new staff members to the organizational clarity and processes? Great question. It takes a while. So we have an onboarding written process where we have. Um, within 48, two or three working days, 
Dave and I take the new person to do a checkup. We have a list of things to make sure Kelly's responsible for covering as the CEO. Dave has his list. Each staff member has a role in or, uh, onboarding so that it's very clear on what the expectations are. And those L10 meetings that are weekly de develops that new habit for that person to realize they're serious. This isn't BS. They do what they say they're going to do. That makes a difference. And then just lastly, what was the resource for identifying trends? Oh, there's tons of resources out there. So um, looking for that slide real quick. You know, we all have different, there's in the communication world, there's communication associations. Transportation, you've got your D, your Department of Transportation, so you have your U.S. Chamber Transportation Committees, cultural changes, demographic changes at the state level. Your state demographer has great information. Your you, The U.S. Census is an amazing tool to understand the changes happening within your community. In Texas, uh, we have the Texas A&M Real Estate Department, which uh, models all the changes that are happening within households, communities. I'm sure within your state, you have that same type of uh, assessments available or research available so you're not having to replicate it. it. We have the University of Houston has a futurist department. So I'm sure you have a university in your state that has a futurist department that you could bring in to just, again, it's not up to you to master. It's up to you to identify the sources in your state or your region and have them come and share that information. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for um, hosting today's webinar. And again, if you'd like to get a hold of Kelly, if you don't mind, just going to that last slide. If anybody hadn't seen your contact information, oh, um, so thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for sharing with us how to build stronger, uh, better organizations. And just as a note, this webinar recording and the accompanying slide will be available on the Institute website. Um, I'll just drop the location here in the chat. So give us about 24 to 48 hours and we typically get that up. Once it is posted, you'll see that on our social media channels as well. Um, and just as a reminder of our upcoming webinar next month, we'll have one on May 25th. We'll have Jason Ball um, hosting a webinar. And just as a reminder, Institute registration is live. Um, in two weeks, the early enrollment deadline closes, so the price will go up. So if you haven't already, make sure to enroll for Institute and join us for Kelly and more um, faculty just in how to better our chambers and associations and communities as a whole. Um, and thank you so much for attending today. Again, if you would like to use this as CAE credit, um, because we are a approved provider, it does qualify for one hour of CAE credit. So just email us at IOM at US Chamber. I'll drop that in the chat as well, if you'd like to receive a webinar certificate. And thank you so much for attending. Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. And we hope you have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you.